for joining uh, this meeting. So uh, what is our agenda? So for today, I'm going to talk about the GVM concurrency models and their informally speaking levels of maturity. So because in GVM we have we can have a lot of concurrency models and today we will have a bit theoretical uh, meetup, a bit theoretical material about uh, what are these levels of maturity, what are these uh, GVM concurrency models, what we can use, what, the, what are the advantages, disadvantages and uh, I have also prepared some code in Java and Kotlin and I hope I will have time to present. So okay, so let's go and I'm sharing my screen. Okay, so I have presentation in PDF file, so let's go. So what we have, what we have now. So first of all, we have concurrency models there are maturity levels. What is it by maturity levels? Maturity levels, it isn't formal. It is a formal definition of, uh, of complexity, of possibility of to solve some problems so like it's a bit informal this definition so first of all we will speak about concurrency and parallelism then concurrency models and maturity levels then and uh, we will this and we will uh, we will review the process-based concurrency model thread-based and grouping fiber actor-based concurrency model so we have three levels here you have three levels here because actually in all computer systems in all programming languages we generally have three levels of concurrency let's go and let's uh, describe it so what about concurrency and parallelism uh, first of all i will go to give some more detailed definitions about what is it concurrency what is it parallel parallelism so first of all, concurrency, it is a logical separation program structure into separate tasks. It can be done at the same time or generally in the same time. But so concurrency, it is more related to the logical structure of program. That structure payload or some working payload, payload algorithms, so tasks can be executed in, in parallel, not maybe in parallel, but generally in parallel, in like a, not in all not in one thread on one task but can be separated and generally in parallel uh, can be processed but what is it what means general in uh, what means uh, generally in parallel because in reality we can have concurrency but this concurrent task can cannot be processed at the same time so we have second definition here parallelism parallelism it is an engine when the uh, task when these tasks are running really simultaneously physically simultaneously on the same processing unit for example central processing so for example for example in programming one which is like ruby python we have threads we have threads we have a lot of uh, possibilities to run tasks simultaneously but interpreter of ruby and python has uh, there is these interpreters have the uh, specific lock named global interpreter lock that prevents the threads from running simultaneously so even if you have several threads in your program several tasks they will not be run uh, they will not be running uh, physically in parallel they will because on the one uh, because the global interpreter lock allows on the one thread to be executed on the inside the process of ruby or python program at the same time so logically we have concurrency in reality you don't have parallelism so this is first point but in java world for example in java program you have the real concurrency real parallelism you have concurrency you can create several several tasks so each task can be bound for example to thread the most simple case each task each thread for example, thread runnable and, and these threads will be running at the same time physically on the same processing unit. Of course, if this processing unit allows several threads, for example, it has several cores, because if you have only one processing unit with one core that doesn't allow any multi-threading, you will have uh, the same way. You will have 
the same picture. You will have concurrency, but you will not have parallelism. You understand, yes? So maybe you have uh, any questions here? So first one about concurrency and parallelism. Okay, so if any, if no questions, so let's proceed. So, so concurrency models, what is a concurrency model? Concurrency model specifies how execution elements in the system collaborate to complete the task they are given. So actually how concurrency is implemented, speaking informally. And also the maturity levels informally define the efficiency of resource utilization and complexity and efficiency also of resource utilization. So how we utilize the resources, how we how complex is the system, how it allows us to do something complex, for example. I will uh, explain later uh, why some simple concurrency model with this simple maturity level doesn't allow us to, for example, to write our own oracle, for example. Yes, it allows us only to write something very simple. So let's go. So first, first, first our Concurrency model, it is process based concurrency model. It is child level of maturity. The best choice for simple cloud microservices. So, child level of maturity it doesn't mean that it is bad processing model. It is not bad. And actually, it is very good in real microservices world. It is very good concurrency model. So, it is not bad. But this concurrency model doesn't allow us to do very complex tasks. What is it? So logical tasks, logical tasks, task how to do something, are mapped to processes. So not to threads or some other, but to processes. For example, Apache, Ruby on Rails, partially Python, partially OCaml, some code based architectures like Lambdas, Lambda functions on Amazon, something like that. So first, first of all, when we need to scale our system, we need to create several processes, not threads inside one process, but several processes. For example, run this Ruby on Rails application several times, and you will receive several processes. And then any scheduler can split the workload across these processes. And you will receive actually horizontal, horizontal scaling. So what are the advantages of this approach? Advantages, no shared data because all data is bound to the process. You know that uh, in this case, you don't have any concurrency issues. So you will not have any requirements of synchronization inside process. You will have process with one thread, for example, Ruby on Rose application, global interpreter walk, you will not have any concurrency issues. No concurrency problems inside process. So very simple model if you need to split the uh, when you need to scale the system horizontally actually this model is well recommended if you have simple comparatively simple processing for example if you can write several lambda functions in amazon and scale it so horizontally so apache works in this process i mean apache is web server apache because it has not the pool of threads but it has a pool of processes uh, scale the workload across, around the across the processes. So OCaml also has its OCaml also has threads inside it, but it uh, has also global interpreter lock, so it doesn't allow to threads to be run in parallel. So in this case, we don't have parallelism in this model. We have only concurrency. But if we have concurrency, we have possibility to scale. So it's it's not bad concurrency model it's not bad but of course you under, you should understand that we are not able to build our own oracle in this model of concurrency because when we need to build something stateful application at least complex stateful application we will have uh, we will have uh, requirements to somehow share it, share the memory and also protect access to the shared memory by using synchronization volatiles uh, transactions and something like that so in this case, here is very simple model. So I will not present it with the code. So you maybe it is quite understandable. Second one is thread-based concurrency model. This is our usual Java thread-based model, for example. This I'm talking about like teenager level of maturity, the best choice to have a, uh, to serve a few complex requests. 
Ah, oh, I'm sorry. What's about disadvantages of this system? Disadvantages are not possibility about process-based concurrency model. Disadvantages are no possibility to write a complex data handling system. Dependency of database or other stateful application. In this system, we will have uh, we need to have some some database. Database that will uh, handle the data, the shared data. We uh, like we move the responsibility of protecting shared data from our application to the database. We delegate this responsibility to the database inside. For example, in uh, under this pool of processes of lambdas, we, we need have to have Oracle or Postgres that really have uh, protect the shared resources. So, for example, so. Uh, it means that we need we cannot work with data by on on this model. We need to have uh, some good database under the hood. Okay, let's go. Thread based concurrency model. So logical tasks are mapped to threads. Usual threads. Threads usually is the threads of uh, operating system. So for example, Java threads, POSIX threads, Windows threads, OpenMP. So Actually, this is uh, when we are using threads as a like a building elements for builds our execution of our logical tasks. So our logical tasks are executed using threads. In this case, we have concurrency and we have real parallelism because several threads, for example, in Java can be run in, in the same time. For example, each threads will be uh, operations operating system will schedule each thread, for example, to each own execution core, for example, or to the same core, for example, core with uh, hyper threading, for example. So, like so, what are advantages of this model? Advantages are lower memory consumption in comparison with process model. So, you see that if you have several processes to handle tasks each process will have a lot of uh, will take a lot of memory Be why because each uh, process has its own metadata information and this metadata information also presents the uh, information related to the processing system to the uh, uh, other memory so if you scale your system by using if you scale your system by using threads uh, you will co consume less memory than if you scale your system using processes so for example if you need to run java application with four threads or you run four java applications with one thread in the last variant you will consume much more memory so and for example this is not a uh, just for now in cloud environments when memory is a resource that is uh, that takes money for example in amazon so memory is not very cheap i mean in virtual cloud provider amazon memory is not cheap so if you have a lot of problems with memory so you will need to pay a lot of money to your cloud provider for example uh, yes so memory consumption and better cpu utilization why better CPU utilization? Because actually we have uh, memory, we have processes uh, switching between processes can be more, more uh, takes more time for from operation systems that switching between threads inside one application. But it is also not optimal. What are the disadvantages of this model? The disadvantages of this model first is data racing. As a potential problem with data racing, potential problems with access to shared data inside application because several threads inside one application will work with the same data and we have potentially a lot of, we can have potentially a lot of problems with shared data. We need, we need synchronization. We need to protect these resources. We need to protect the memory accessed by several threads inside one processes. I don't uh, see that we always will have problems because we can, we can apply transactions we can apply uh, proper synchronization so we can avoid the actual errors but usually we need to do a lot of 
work to prevent the data racing, prevent the access to shared memory. I mean, bad access to shared memory. We need to protect the shared memory here. Second one, it is uh, frequent context switching. When uh, processing unit switches from one thread to another thread, it means the uh, uh, processing unit, for example, processing core, calculation core in processor switches the context of the threads. And this switch operation is uh, not very cheap in terms of resource utilization. So we will have frequent context switching here. Uh, second one, it is limited number of threads. Actually, we cannot create more than maybe two or three thousand threads in, for example, in some applications, maybe more, but actually we will not be able to create a lot of threads. And if we create a lot of threads, we will have also problems with memory consumption or something like that. So, we, but we are not able to handle a lot of threads. For example, about millions of threads, operation system will not allow us to do that. And the third, the third element, it is possible callback hell. Possible callback hell. Because actually, in many cases, the thread-based concurrency model also includes the possibility to run code asynchronously. And with this asynchronous model, usually we will have callback hell. I will present it in comments. So, so, so thread based, but using thread based model, we can have possibility to build the complex application. For example, from my experience, I was a developer on some past time on projects that contains its own, like its own small database inside it with synchronization with uh, transactions, something like that. So we can actually build our small Oracle with thread-based models. So we have more power here. We can have more power and more possibility to build something complex. But of course, um, usually this model is not well recommended in, um, it's not very well recommended in microservices world. So this thread model is more like for Micro applications, uh, something, something more complex tasks than simple microservices. So, what are the ways how to improve it? How to improve this thread-based concurrency model? This thread-based concurrency model can be improved by using tasks. Tasks. Tasks can be executed in thread pool by using, for example, executor in Java. So we are not creating each thread for each task, but we create some parts of functionality as task and several threads, for example, small number of threads, for example, four threads can execute a lot of tasks. In this case, we are improving thread-based concurrency model. Advantages are better resources utilization in case when no blocking operations used. So we have better utilization in, we, we have better uh, resources utilization because we are not creating millions of threads. We can create millions of tasks and we have only four threads, for example, to execute these tasks. So it is a, a somehow evolutionary improvement of uh, design of thread-based applications. But we have the same disadvantages, same problems with resource synchronization. We still have to synchronize our resources. We have problems with resources utilization in case of blocking operation. For example, if operation one task perform some blocking call, for example, waiting for some monitor, waiting for response from blocking socket, we, this thread will be out of game and we need to create more threads here. So one blocking task can block entire thread. At this very interesting moment. And uh, in this case, we need to increase the number of thread pool used to execute tasks because if, for example, if we have uh, four threads in thread pool, and for example, one thread received tasks that you, that became blocked, and so a second thread received tasks that, uh, that uh, causes thread to block. And then we have only two threads remaining to work with tasks. So in this case, we need to dynamically add more threads into pool. So in this case, if we have a lot of blocking tasks, we need to have a lot of threads. So we are not. We are not handling our problems completely. We are not 
solving our problems completely. Of course, we can move to some modern reactive technologies trying to have non locking solutions, but it is also not a complete solution. Okay, so maybe here I will present some code. This is a very, very simple code, for example, like prototypes and pure proof of concept that presents this that presents this picture. So for example, we have main application that is used, for example, threaded server. So let's look on this class threaded server. So threaded server, it calculates numbers, but it calculates numbers by using thread. For example, each thread contains the runnable inside it and do some operations, for example. So the main point of these threads is to calculate some very simple calculation of numbers. For example, iterate around 1,000 of numbers and make some simple sum of it. And uh, multiply by some random numbers. And we have callback. So first of all, let's look on the how the how the results we'll have. So we have clients for the server. We have server. And we calculate number, and result of this number is returned. And the result of this execution in the, is returned in this callback. So we have callback hell, for example. Here we have simple callback, but here we have at least we have problems because we have callback, and in this callback we need to somehow unblock the client because this client will wait. This code will wait until the server uh, receives the result until server uh, returns the result. So we have, for, you see here, so we threaded model, you see here, go back, it's one problem. You see here, requirements of waiting, synchronization, uh, synchronized void. So for example, this, I will execute this of course, but this, uh, this example demonstrates that raw thread, raw thread based model is very uncomfortable to work with is very uncomfortable. So at least we need somehow to improve it. How we can improve it? We can use task server. In task server, for example, we have some executor that contains, for example, 10 threads here. And we send a task to this executor and this task will do exactly the same and it will notify the future. Future? Futures, completable futures. There are something like very close to the reactive programming model. We have here, we don't have here synchronizations to wait for results. For example, you will see here future cloud. You will have future, for example, less stupid future. Apply, we have future, we can combine a sync. So you see here that we can combine a sync, we can apply, so we can join. So, for example, we can have some more interesting work with futures. So futures are more clever than, for example, stupid model is just thread based and waiting for synchronization. So, but here I still need to wait for results. So at least I still need to use join. I still need to wait for results from all futures because I cannot move next or before I cannot receive these results. So, also in future model, I also need to have, uh, I also need to have blocking call because I need to receive the result and I need to wait for this result. So I need to block my current calculation process to wait for the result. So now I will run this application. I hope it will be executed. Let's go. I will have for the third concurrency model, I have the examples in Kotlin, using Kotlin coroutines. Okay, so what we have here? We have here exactly the same, around the same time. So 
our thread based client takes this time, future based client takes this time. So the results are the same. And the results are actually the same. I can present it here, but the results are the same. So actually, this client is, is correct. I mean, this code is correct, but it is not very beautiful. Yes, not very comfortable to work with. This one client is more is better because it has computable future it has an apply it has a combination of future so we have a better possibility to, to refactor our code better possibility to present our functionality but it is also not very not not very good because because we still have our callbacks we still have to block for the call to receive as a result, we still have uh, problems because we have possible because we have, for example, fixes thread pool. And if we have ten, if we send ten blocking tasks, our execution will be stopped because we have only, for example, ten threads here. So, so we have we still have uh, we still see the limitations of our thread based processing model. What to do next? I mean, what we have, we uh, fortunately in Java world, we have uh, to do, we can do something. We can proceed to the better concurrency model. And, uh, but I will also return to this thread based model after I will present the uh, polluting fiber actor based concurrency model, I will return to, uh, to this concurrency model and I will explain why this thread based model is also not very bad it is not bad and i will explain why it is not bad so just for now uh, so this is also not very bad so but let's go further okay so and we have the third level of maturity and third uh, family of concurrency models it is fiber routine actor based concurrency models it is I am talking about it like an adult level of maturity. It is adults concurrency model. It is the best choice to serve many requests, for example, chat application. So, for example, let's uh, one moment. Let's return to the. Uh, oh no, no. Let's let's uh, consider this. Let's provide with this model. Let's continue with this model. So this model is the best choice to serve many requests, for example, chat application. What, what it means? For example, we have some server, for example, multi-user game server of chat or chat server of tele or telecommunication server that needs to serve a very big amount of uh, comparatively simple requests. So each request takes not a big amount of time, but we have a lot of uh, a big quantity of this request, a lot of requests, for example, millions and millions of requests. So in this, uh, this concurrency model is the best fit for, for this uh, kind of task. So in this model, logical tasks are mapped to lightweight special threads as execution elements. So V, uh, we are, for example, we are programming in terms not of threads, but of some lightweight or green threads of fibers or coroutines. So, for example, it, uh, uh, there are Kotlin coroutines, Scala Zio fibers, B fibers, Go coroutines, Scala actors. And, for example, there are lightweight threads like uh, lightweight processes in Erlang or lightweight Java processes in uh, Java Loom. Today I have also the bonus information. I will provide something, uh, tell something about uh, Java Project Loom. And this Java Project Loom is very similar to Kotlin coroutines and Scala fibers. So what are these lightweight uh, execution elements? What are they? So this, uh, each of these lightweight threads, it's like, it's, it is like a task. It is evolution, evolutionary process, uh, evolutionary result of evolution applied to the tasks. But this task, when it receives blocking call, can be suspended and then resumed after it receives the result of this blocking call. So it doesn't block 
the execution thread, the background execution thread. For example, so these lightweight special threads are executed using the same uh, the same thread based executors. So, for example, under under the hood, we have the same uh, for example executor service as we have for thread based computer model for tasks, but if we have usual task, for example, in Java, if we have usual task, this usual task, when it receives, for example, blocking call, for example, synchronization or something like that, it stops the threads, the current thread, the thread that executes this task. It tells, so thread is blocked. But in case when we have lightweight processing thread, if this lightweight processing thread receives something like some calls that require some blocking. It is not actually blocking, it calls suspended in Kotlin. It switches itself into, into special state. And this background processing thread can move this into some buffer, this task, and work with other lightweight threads that are in the uh, runnable state. So we are not blocking our background thread. And it is the actually the main difference between lightweight threads and uh, actual tasks. So lightweight or green threads or coroutines or fibers are a special kind of tasks. Tasks, these tasks, I mean. I mean these tasks that we execute here. But for example, in case of usual task model service, this thread executor cannot move, uh, cannot switch from one task to other task during the execution. It needs to uh, complete the task and then it can take the uh, second, next task from the some buffer or some queue. But in case of coroutine, it can switch the state of this coroutine or fiber or lightweight thread into some state, then takes uh, as a thread, processed it, and then returned to the task that it uh, moved to the some suspended state and resume it to make it all make it uh, alive, make it resume it and resume processing on the point that it stopped. So, so this is a very powerful computing processing model. Very powerful. It is all uh, actually all. Mm, powerful computing models ha have this uh, execution elements. For example, we can we have routines in Kotlin. We have fibers in Scala Zero. Scala Zero is very powerful uh, library for concurrency and asynchronous programming in Scala world. I know. So Scala Zero uh, it has fibers. So fibers. We can say that fibers and coroutines are almost the same. So their differences are very, very, um, very, very small. So we can say that coroutines are generally the same as fibers. So we have zero fibers. We can, we have fibers in D. We have coroutines in Go. Coroutines is also the same, special lightweight, special threads. So, and we have Scala actors. What is actor? Actor, it is fiber or coroutine, but with dedicated mailbox of messages. We can send message to this coroutine or fiber. Actually, usually, usually coroutines or fibers doesn't have the dedicated mailbox of inbound messages and our mailbox of outbound messages. But actor, it is a fiber or coroutine that has the inbound messages and outbound messages. But they are also fibers and coroutine, and they are also executed the same as, as usual tasks. Okay, uh, so what are the advantages of this model? Advantages are a lower memory consumption in comparison with process model, with also the thread model. And actually we have the best memory consumption here because, because we don't need to create several threads. We have, for example, we set our, for example, thread pool to 10 threads. And it always will be stand. We will not have the situation when we need to increase the number of threads. The number of threads will remain the same. And we can uh, create a lot of these coroutines. 
we can have a lot of coroutines. We can create thousands, millions of coroutines because coroutines are very lightweight, very lightweight. So we can create billions of coroutines. Actually, some some very high load quantum projects serves millions of requests per second and millions of coroutines because each request is served as one coroutine. For example, we have one coroutine per request. But under the hood, we can we have the same 10 threads. Why we need to limit the number of threads? Because actually, we should not have a lot of threads in our application. Because if, for example, we have processing unit with, for example, four processing cores, and each of processing core, CPU core, is hyper-threaded, uh, then we, for example, hyper-threading is two. Each processing core can handle two threads. Then we need, we should not have a lot of threads because we have actually eight real processing element, processing elements. So, and there is uh, an empirical formula that the number of threads, real threads, not corroding the figures that real threads, should be not bigger than uh, one and half multiplied by the number of cores, processing cores. So, if we have eight processing cores, we should not have more than 20, uh, 12 real threads. Real threads. If we have bigger, we will spend a lot of time on the context switching. So, this not be our this, this uh, model will not be optimal. So the optimal model, if when we have the, for example, less amount of real threads, for example, but we have a lot of lightweight threads. So. We have better CPU utilization, low rate of, of context switching. Why low rate? Because, for example, each thread uh, operation system can can schedule threads, and it schedules one thread, for example, per operating core. And this one thread runs on this core, takes a lot of coroutines, one coroutine, second, third, and uh, more. And uh, as a result, uh, but it is not moved from this core. So it's, so context is not switched. Thread works on this core. It is not moved to other processing core. It just handle these coroutines, handle these tasks. So as a result, we will not have any context switching actually. So in context will not be switched. We will have only one thread per, per processing core and it handles, uh, for example, one thread can handle millions of coroutines actually without complex context switching because maybe yeah something some switching will be because operation operation operations are uh, different in processes but we will not have a complex context switching here so we have a lot of benefits but it also depends upon the um, implementation of scheduling for these systems because for example if we have stupid operation system with bad scheduler for example and we have not very clever implementation of coroutine or fibers engine, we will not have a very big optimization here, for example. Because, for example, in Kotlin, coroutine's engine is very simple. It doesn't have its own scheduler inside it. It totally relies on Java and operation system schedulers. So it is just a, something, some software, software level around task execution. But for example, in Erwand, Erwand has its own scheduler for these green threads, for these fibers, for actors. In Erwand, we have actors. So it, it uh, doesn't rely on the um, actually operation system scheduler for scheduling. And Go itself, Go, uh, Go Lang has the, its own uh, scheduler for these Go routines because it has the, we have schedule an operation system and we have schedule in this uh, backend uh, runtime of these uh, fibers, coroutines. But in case of Kotlin, we don't have uh, coroutine scheduler. We have only thread scheduler. So coroutine system is not very com complex in, uh, under the hood. So we just have something like uh, software level based on the task execution. We, not have, we don't have very complex uh, magic here so what's more what well, the global probability of data racing we still have possibility of data racing 
we still have. But we have lower probability because actually coroutines, we can, for example, play with uh, some concurrency engines. So actually we have just a lower probability, but we still have the problems of data racing. So using coroutines of Ubus doesn't, uh, it by itself, it doesn't uh, secure us from data racing problems. But if, for example, we are using channels, not only just coroutines, but we use special concurrency uh, classes to uh, exchange the data exchange between these coroutines, for example, they are named channels. If you are using channels, yes, then we are securing itself from the data racing. So let's talk about lower probability of data racing problems and possibility to avoid callback hell. I will present how in Kotlin we can avoid callback hell. Why we can avoid? Because we have, because we can uh, rely on this suspend resume pair of operations. And this suspend resume pair of operations allow us to write asynchronous callback code as synchronous. So in some in some points, this uh, concurrent, this uh, fibers of routing models allow us for, for the developer to avoid callback hell. But it doesn't uh, prevent us from other problems. So this concurrency model is quite powerful and it also has some problems. So we have disadvantages of this model. Synchronization is still somewhere needed. For example, if we are not using, for example, if we are not using uh, channels, we still need to have volatile, synchronized, uh, mute access, semaphores. We still need to have all this synchronization. And we still need to put, we still have to protect our shared data. Second one, special transaction handle, handling is required because some transaction hand, some Java-based transaction engines works not very good with routines and fibers because transaction context usually is bound to this thread, real thread, Java thread. But in this case, uh, we cannot bound to this thread because transaction can be used by several routines and routine can be moved from one thread to another thread. So in this case, special attention to the transaction handling is needed because for example, it depends upon what transaction library and GDBC driver we're using because some transaction drivers are quite uh, good for it. For example, like modern POSRS reactive from database driver or something like that or ODB and so in some cases we can have problems. So in some cases we can have real problems with transaction handling. We can some we can have problems with debug in the operation system in, in JDM because why? Because Java debugger is bound also to the thread, to the real Java thread. And for example, in case of fiber routine based, it's debugger can become crazy. It doesn't understand what to do. And I have seen it. Of course, JID, uh, JetBrains company, they invest money on their JID and JID tries to somehow to debug better, to, to provide better user experience of debugging routines, but debugging routines is more complex than debugging usual Java threads. Because why? Because JID by itself doesn't have debugger. It relies on the Java provided debugger and Java provided debugger relies on the Java thread based model, not on coroutines or fiber model. It uh, bounds the debugger stack and debugger window for user to the thread, not to the coroutine. That's why we can have real problems with the bug of coroutines and in JID sometimes. Yes, we, I see it by myself. So it is, so we need to be attentive here. And sometimes between the bridge between normal code and Kotlin code is required. Kotlin. Somehow we need to, in Kotlin, there is a bridge between Kotlin code and normal code. So we need to be attentive when we mix Kotlin based code and normal code. Normal code, it means thread based code. And of course, we can have also problems with distributed tracing because distributed tracing relies on the tracing that it serves in the thread worker. And thread worker passes bound to the thread, not to the Kotlin. So actually we can have a lot of problems with any of the, with a lot, a big quantity of Java libraries here. So that's why project room is also 
I need to talk uh, on project loom some words. Project loom, it is fiber implementation for Java. It is almost the same as Kotlin Compose, but it is delayed and it will be delayed uh, for um, years because uh, GDK team and I was on a conference on online meetup with uh, representatives from um, Java, uh, GraalVM, GDK team. And this guy told us that actually there are a lot of problems with bridge between uh, usual Java code, for example, GDBC drivers, uh, other parts of Java platform and project room because, the, because a lot of a lot of moments in Java world is are bound to the thread as execution element, not to the protein of fiber. Because so I can say that we will not have um, project on quickly. So we should not rely to, to receive quickly receive uh, totally correct project room implementation. Yeah. So just for now, we can play with Scala Z or Fiber, so we can play with Kotlin Corinthians. <laughs> So, so the situation with project room is complex because this concurrency model is quite powerful and GDK team tries not to introduce any problems with backward compatibility. So they need to seamlessly integrate the project room inside the current thread based libraries of Java. And uh, of course they have problems with it because uh, actually we usually we need bridge between normal code I mean, thread-based code and routines-based code. We need a bridge because without this bridge, we will have problems. In Kotlin, this bridge is de defined on the compiler level. I will present it. But in Java world, they actually maybe don't know what to do with this bridge because, uh, for example, in Erlang world, we don't have this bridge. Why? Because we don't have alternatives of actor based model in the wrong world. In the wrong world, world uh, every task is bound to actor. There is no other possibilities to do. But in Java world, we can create several threads and using usual tasks, and then we can create routines. So there is a something problems how to uh, how to unify, how to combine this path of course. So so the situation with uh, this fiber routine actor based concurrency model is complex. For, for example, now we have good workable models of Kotlin coroutines, Scala fibers, for example, Scala actors. But we need also to understand that uh, this, uh, for example, for mission critical application, maybe, maybe it is better to use uh, simple thread based code model. And so let's go to the code. I will present the code now and then I will return and I will uh, present the one additional moment about it. What are disadvantages in terms of business oriented applications with thread based model and, and routine based model models. So let's return to the code. So here I have created some Kotlin routine server, for example. And uh, I have created routing client. So here I have the also the same engine. It is almost the same. I mean, calculate number. So here we use this this very simple point. We have global async, async, and here we have this code. So it's like a sending task here. And we need this. We need to declare this model as suspend. It we told compiler that this uh, function uses coroutine. So this is a bridge introduced on compiler based code. Uh, on compiler, this is bridge introduced on compiler, introduced by compiler on the uh, level of language. So, and here we have this same engine, or the same function also suspend and also we send some code as Kurutin. So global scene context, actually this is a code how to execute Kurutin. And here is in brackets, we have Kurutin code. And here we have Kotlin client. So client is very simple. You see here, we can also have, for example, get number, for example, 
we are using also we have we are using also stupid server this rather server and we are using curve server to open server and how we for example for example we have the bridge between usual callback we need we can use special construction name suspend routing and we present our callback based code into routing code using kotlin so here we have we get stupid number so for example we have stupid def await we have whoever def async we have the same pairs and in kotlin routing we have the same async await Pairs. It is uh, used also in JavaScript and TypeScript. So it is when we need to receive some future-like processes. So we need, we can async. We need to when we are using async, we send the code that returns some result. And we can wait for this result using await. But in in this case, await will not block our execution thread. Await when we are using await here, we switch this routing to the some specific await thread and thread that you uh, that process this routing will switch to other routines and then returns to these elements when await receives the result so for us you will see that we have a more clear clean code here so we don't have uh, complex callbacks we actually we have the we are using this we are working with asynchronous code uh, uh, exactly the same way as, as with synchronous code you see here so await await so there are these calls are synchronous but we are working with it in code like with synchronous code so we totally uh, remove the callback hell here and we have also the bridge we can build the bridge between old callback and related code you see here with callbacks and the bridge we are using suspend routing to build a special special routing that uh, is built around this callback hell. So we can isolate the callback code, put old callback code with routines, and then build our clean clean code using routines. So very interesting possibility. It is all about routines. I didn't prepare the Scala related code because I think it's maybe out of scope of this of this uh, meetup so let's go let's execute this Kotlin code so and here Kotlin server you can see here also so at least you can see here that uh, our code for execution is much more simple it's much simpler than uh, for example even this code and the future based client you see here yes Oh, oh, this one, yes. So this one is not, it's not very beautiful. Yes, it's synchronized, wait. So, so this, this code is much more, is much better. So coroutine code, it is coroutine, uh, pro coroutine execution model is very powerful. And this execution model, uh, I mean, Kotlin coroutines processing engine is very powerful. It, it really um, implements the routines of fiber based concurrency model. It is very powerful, uh, too, very powerful. And uh, actually, the most, most matured software execution uh, libraries, software execution uh, systems uh, have these fibers of routines based. Uh, through based uh, libraries, for example, Akka. Akka is very mature and very powerful execution framework for Scala, and then it uses actors. And actors are based on the, are executed under the hood on the limited number of threads. So Kotlin, uh, Kotlin library is more simple than Akka actors, but it's also not very, very simple because unfortunately Kotlin API is good, but it's also not very simple, not very simple. It requires some time to, to learn, to investigate. So it's not very simple. So, but let's go, let's execute this code.
Mm. Oh, also works, but we have slightly more time than the several other people. Oh no, we have almost the same time here, but maybe slightly bigger time because in case of in case of Java thread and future based code, we have like here at this time one about one thousand, and in Kotlin code we still we have a bit bigger time. So so. So maybe I uh, now I should explain the real uh, advantages, technologies, advantages, and use cases when it is better to use routine or fiber concurrency model code, and when it is maybe better to use uh, simple Java thread based concurrency model. So. here you can see also same as so the main main point here is that if uh, from my point of view it's my own point of view so uh maybe mistaken maybe but from my own point of view uh, the Kotlin for routine or fiber related code uh, maybe uh, is required to be used when it is necessary to handle a lot of relatively small requests. When, or we need to avoid fallback. Uh, so two cases. When, for example, our code is not very uh, complex and it is not high load, for example, you have, for example, one of my past projects experience, it was a application, a relatively complex Java application, monolith based application, but it was not uh, it was not uh, it doesn't uh, it didn't handle the external requests so it works uh, it worked only inside the corporative network it was not a product like in, uh, with uh, public address or something like that it was a calculation engine for specific financial calculations that was required only by some financial department of company, a big USA based company, a big USA company. So it doesn't need, it didn't require some public post public address, it works inside the uh, corporative network. And it uh, handled the relatively small amount of requests, for example, two or three requests per per day but each of these requests was very complex because it to require it required uh, calls to oracle complex logic handling this data from oracle transactions something like that so in this case code in routing code will not help uh, because we have we have a lot a small amount of requests and each of requests is uh, very complex, takes a lot of time. So in this case, usual thread-based model will be optimal way. So we don't need routing or fibers engine here. We just can work with uh, real thread-based, actually usual thread-based Java model. We don't need any fibers or routing sectors here. But for example, if you are building the, for example, multiplayer social chat or something like that, and you have a lot of connections, Maybe here the Kotlin routines of fiber will be better. Because you see, if you have a small amount of requests, fiber of routines will not give you uh, optimization by time or something. If you have the optimization when we have uh, millions of routines in comparison with millions of threads. And also the same, uh, also the same is for mission critical application. If application is mission critical, so any problem with any library is a very bad situation when we need to be totally sure that our application works correctly. And uh, we need like solid 
solid based uh, rock solid implementation then the uh, usual java thread based implementation will be better because you will not have problems with tracing with debugging with other problems but in any other cases and you do usually when we have a lot of callbacks and uh, we have uh, you have programmers that wants that want to work with something new and you need to avoid go back how you need to to do kind of a lot of requests and maybe the uh, i think Kotlin, Kurukin or scala actors will be better uh, choice and especially if you have a big amount of concurrency tasks in your application then scala actors or Kotlin routines will be the best choice because these models are actually they are mature they are ready models because for example project room is not yet totally production ready but Kotlin routine core is production ready and scala actors are production ready and zero fibers is production ready uh, so if you have a great degree of concurrency and real parallelism in your system, it will be better to use uh, fiber actors or routines system. Okay, so let's move on to the questions. So I'm open to your questions. Please ask your questions. Uh, I will be glad to see, see your questions, your impressions about yeah, 